Again, I am glad that you are here this morning. If you are here for the first time, you're picking up, this is going to be your first message of the last message in a five-part series that we've been doing on the book of Esther. And I so appreciate, and I mean that, the comments that we've been getting back and that the staff has been getting back and that life groups have been sharing with us on this series. And I'm absolutely convinced it is not me speaking, it is God. It is God speaking through the series. And I'm loving how God is using the series to, so that you find yourself in the story of Esther. I think every one of us finds ourselves in the story of Esther at some point in time in our life, and maybe that's now, saying, where is God? What is God doing? In all of the chaos, right? And I've said this a number of times the past few weeks. When I listen to the news, watch the news, whatever, or look at the headlines online, it's like, what is going on in our world, right? It just doesn't make sense to us. There's just so much tension, so much, so much evil, so much that just isn't right. And you say, God, where are you? What are you doing? And then you look at a book like Esther and you see how God does work all things out, right? We don't know how all of this today is going to work out, right? But we know God is working it out. We know God's got a plan and we look at that and we see that throughout the entire scriptures, right? Turnarounds. And that's what I talked about last week, how God is in the business of turnarounds. These 180 degree turnarounds. The book of Esther, it's turnaround after turnaround after turnaround. You thought this was going to happen, this is what looked like was going to happen, and then something totally different happens. And to prove the point that God is a God of turnarounds, what I did last week is in my, as I said, my little pea brain, I went through kind of scripture. And, and try to remember as best as I could. And I started out with Abraham, and I talked about Abraham and Isaac, and I talked about Daniel, and I talked about Job, right? And I talked about Paul, and I talked about Jesus, and then I talked about Moses, and I talked about Noah. And I said that Moses had a drinking problem. It was Noah. I was wrong. And I'm so grateful that so many of you nailed me on that. Because it just proves you're listening. So what I'm going to do is throw a few more mistakes in periodically so that you can come back to me and say you were wrong. And I'm going, I might have been wrong, but you were listening. I appreciated that. I really did. I appreciated that. And anyway, the second thing I want, I want to point out, and I do that sometimes. My mouth goes much faster than my brain, right? So I'm rolling through that, and I did another thing, and I gave you an analogy of chess. And I said how God is moving, right? It's like, I said, it's like God has got like this, like this chessboard, and work with me, right? God has got like this chessboard, and he's moving, and I don't know anything about chess, but he's like moving the pieces in place, and then boom, something happens, right? Well, somebody sent me a text on that as well, and this is what it said. Let me find it here a minute. It said, FYI, a bit of trivia about your chess analogy. And I, I really, I appreciated this. This is really cool. It says, Chess came from Persia. Who have we been talking about? The Medes and the Persians, right? Chess came from Persia, and it said that checkmate came from the, the, the Hebrew word, Jewish word, shamat, that means the king is dead. Fits right into the Esther story. Now this morning we're going to look at Esther's story again, and I want to bring you up to speed on a little bit of where we left off, because we looked at chapters 1 through 8 from the book of Esther. This morning we're going to look at chapter 9 and 10. It's a long text. 9 is a long text. 10 is only three verses. We have to look at the text because we need to finish the story, and if we don't read the whole thing, we miss part of the story, right? But to bring us up to speed, in case we haven't been uh, involved in it. Where we left off last week is Esther had two requests. She went to the king, right? Esther knew that if she went to the king without permission, and she went without permission, she knew that if he didn't raise his scepter, she could have been killed. She had no right going in to see the king without permission. He raised his scepter, and he's like, my dear Esther, Queen Esther, what would you like? She's like, I got two requests. One, I want you to come to a banquet today, and I'm going to have another banquet tomorrow, and it's, I want you and Haman to come, right? He grants those requests for the banquet. So permission granted, right? She wasn't killed. Part of Esther's plan for the banquets was to reveal her Jewish identity. 
Esther is an exiled Jew in Babylon, Persia, and she's probably third generation. The Babylonians wanted to take out the Jews, kill the Jews. Esther's Jewish. She's married to the king now, king and queen, right? King Xerxes, Queen Esther. But she's Jewish and she hasn't revealed her nationality or her identity. She's going to reveal her identity during these banquets. King Xerxes says to Esther, Esther, I'll give you anything you want up to half the kingdom. Anything you want up to half the kingdom. Now remember, when there were laws set in the, in, in the Babylonian Empire, the laws of the Medes and the Persians cannot be revoked. The law is the law. There's no changing it. There's a death sentence against the Jews. The death sentence against the Jews was pretty much predicated or set up by Haman. Haman's also going to attend the banquet. Esther shares the plot during the banquet. I should say during the banquet, Esther shares the plot with the king that there's a plan to kill the Jews. Esther's Jewish. And the king's like, this can't happen, right? Who did this? Who set this plot up? And she says, your right-hand man, Haman. The law can't be changed because it's the law of the Medes and the Persians and it can't be revoked. You see the problem? And King Xerxes is furious because he knows what's going to happen. And this can't happen. So, we're going to pick up the text here because there's a turnaround. There's a huge turnaround, right? You see how the table is sort of set here, how everything's in motion. The Jews are going to be killed. And Mordecai, is he, he's still her dad, right? And Haman, he's, there's, who was the, he, Haman was the guy who had it all. He was calling all the shots. He was looked after, right? Now the king is against Haman. There's a turnaround, okay? And the biggest part of the turnaround is this. Because the law of the Medes and the Persians can't be changed, there's the edict that says the Jews have to be killed. The king says, I have to do something else. So the king issues a new law. The king issues a law that says the Jews can can protect themselves basically at any cost. They can kill, annihilate, destroy, whatever, anybody who's going to oppose them. Wait a minute. The Babylonians who were holding the exiles captive can now be killed by the Jewish people? That's the new law. And because of the new law, the people who were in the land were afraid of the exiled people, and many of them became Jewish. I encourage you to go back and look at the story, right? And if you didn't pick up the book from Max Lucado, a lot of this is in the books as well, made for this moment. It's an incredible story, right? Let's, let's pray and then let's pick up the text. Father, there's a lot going on in this, in this text this morning, and for those who may be visiting, maybe figuring out what is he talking about? Where, what, what's going on here? Lord, this morning as we, we finish up this last piece, I pray that each of us again would, would be able to pull the pieces together and that you would speak to us to hear what you want us to hear. And, and part of that is that every one of us is, is, is not where we are by just some, some chance or fate. It's part of your plan. Every one of us has has a role, has a piece to play to carry out your plan to the people around us. So this morning as we finish the story of Esther, I pray that you would speak to each of us where we are. And I just ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So Esther, starting in uh, verse 1, chapter 9. This is the victory of the Jews, okay? It says, so on March 7, the two decrees of the king went out and they were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the king's provinces to attack anyone who tried to harm them. But no one could make a stand against them, for everyone was afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the highest officers, the governors, and the royal officials helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai. For Mordecai had been promoted in the king's palace 
and his fame spread throughout all the provinces as he became more and more powerful. So the Jews went ahead on the appointed day and struck down their enemies with the sword. They killed and annihilated their enemies and did as they, pre- as they pleased with those who hated them. In the fortress of Susa itself, the Jews killed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Delphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adaliah, Aditha, Permashtha, Erisel, Eridel, and Verisatha. The ten sons of Haman, okay, the ten sons of Haman, sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they did not take any plunder. In other words, they wiped out everybody for the most part. That day, when the king was informed of the number of people killed in the fortress of Susa, he called for Queen Esther, and he said, the Jews have killed 500 men in the fortress of Susa alone, as well as Haman's ten sons. If they have done that here, what has happened in the rest of the provinces? But now, what more do you want? It'll be granted to you. Tell me, and I'll do it, the king says. Esther responded, she says, If it pleases the king, give the Jews of Susa permission to do it again tomorrow, as they have done today. And let the bodies of Haman's ten sons be impaled on a pole. So the king agreed, and the decree was announced in Susa, and they impaled the bodies of Haman's ten sons. Then the Jews of Susa gathered together on March 8 and killed 300 more men. And again, they took no plunder. Meanwhile, the other Jews throughout the king's provinces had gathered together to defend their lives. They gained relief from all of their enemies, killing 75,000 of them who hated them. But they didn't take any of the plunder. This was done throughout the provinces on March 7 and on March 8. They rested, celebrating their victory with a day of feasting and gladness. The Jews of Susa killed their enemies on March 7 and again on March 8, then rested on March 9, making that day a day of feasting and gladness. So to this day, rural Jews living in remote villages celebrate an annual festival and holiday on the appointed day in late winter when they rejoice and send gifts of food to each other. Then you have the festival of Purim. We'll talk about this a minute. It says, Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to the Jews near and far throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes. And if you remember, there were 127 provinces. It says, calling on them to celebrate an annual festival on these two days. He told them to celebrate these days with feasting and gladness and by giving gifts of food to each other and presents to the poor. This would commemorate, commemorate time, a time when the Jews gained relief from their enemies, when their sorrow was turned into gladness, and their mourning into joy. So the Jews accepted Mordecai's proposal and adopted this annual custom. Haman, son of Hamatha the Agite, the enemy of the Jews, had plotted to crush and destroy them on the date determined by casting lots. The lots were called Purim. But when Esther came before the king, he issued a decree causing Haman's evil plot to backfire. And Haman and his sons were impaled on a sharpened pole. This is a record in here, okay? Then it says, this is why the celebration is called Purim, because it is the ancient word for casting lots. So because of Mordecai's letter and because of what they had experienced, the Jews throughout the realm agreed, the region agreed to inaugurate this tradition and pass it on to their descendants and to all who became Jews. They declared they would never fail to celebrate these two prescribed days at the appointed time each year. These days would be remembrance and kept from generation, or remembered rather, and kept from generation to generation and celebrated by every family throughout the provinces and cities of the empire. This festival of Purim would never cease to be celebrated among the Jews, nor would the memory of whatever happened die out among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihu, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote another letter, putting the queen's full authority behind Mordecai's letter to establish the festival of Purim. Letters wishing peace and security were sent to the Jews throughout the 127 provinces of the empire of Xerxes. 
These letters establish the festival of Purim, an annual celebration of these days at the appointed time, decreed by both Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther. The people decided to observe this festival just as they had decided for themselves and descendants to establish the times of fasting and mourning. So the command of Esther confirmed the practices of Purim, and it was all written down in the records. Then the final verses, the greatness of Xerxes and Mordecai from chapter 10. King Xerxes imposed a tribute throughout his empire, even to the distant coastlands. His great achievements and full account of the greatness of Mordecai, with whom the king had promoted, are recorded in the book of history of the kings of Media and Persia. Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister with authority next to that of King Xerxes himself. He was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people and to speak up for the welfare of all their descendants. That's how the story of Esther, the book of Esther, ends. If I were to look at that story and try to capture it, and if I were to ask you, what did you take from this story, I think every one of us would have different takeaways. What's involved in the story of Esther? Everything from an orphan girl, rags to riches, to plots that went bad, to a death sentence, to new life. To the weaker becoming the stronger, and the stronger becoming the weaker, and on and on and on. It's a story of turnarounds, isn't it? The book of Esther is seriously a story of turnaround after turnaround after turnaround. I think it's one of the most interesting book stories in, in Scripture. Nowhere in the book of Esther is God mentioned, but God is making all of these moves. At some time, I think I'd like to do a series on Job. Because Job is another one of those books where it's just a story of a person, a story of a life, and you have to read the whole thing to understand what's happening. It's a story of having everything and a story of having nothing. Here's a story of having nothing and then having everything. People who were exiled, everything taken away from them, ending up in charge. And their people taking over a land. Mordecai adopts his cousin, gets a job outside of the palace of Susa. He gets inside information. He hears what's going on. He's got his ear to the fence and knows what's going on inside the gates. He becomes the prime minister. How does that happen? When everything was against the Jews, the end of the book says Mordecai did everything he could to promote the welfare of his people. God. God stepping in in a way that we could never understand. If you read the first two, three chapters of the book and try to figure out where the end of this book is going to end, you probably wouldn't come up with that as your guess, if you will. 10 says, Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister. With authority next to that of Xerxes himself, he was great among his people, the Jews. They held him in high esteem because he worked for the good of his people. There's proof here. Several things I want us to take away this morning. Proof that God not only has a plan or that God is working out his plan, but there's more. That, that, that's, that's, that's there, right? If you look at chapters 1 through 8, it's, it's God, his plan, working out his plan in all of his people. But if you get to 9 and 10, 9 and 10 are somewhat different. Yes, we just heard how the story ends, but there's two things in 9 and 10 that, that I think are significant there. The word remember and celebrate. Chapter 9 and 10, they seem long, they're kind of short. I know they took a while to read this morning, but if you go back and you look at them and you circle or highlight or whatever you want to do with your tablet to make note of it, there's two words that stand out and it's remember. Remember God's faithfulness. Remember what God has done. Look back and you'll see that God was at work and executed His plan. And it says after you remember, it says be thankful, give thanks, and celebrate. Celebrate. So they set up a festival every year to celebrate, didn't they? They called it Purim. The Jewish people today still celebrate Purim. It's part of their tradition. Purim is the only Jewish festival 
that was not set by Moses. If you go back and you look at the Old Testament at the Pentateuch, the first five books, right, the books of the law, all of the festivals are in there except for Purim. Purim didn't happen until we get to Esther. And not only did it say, be thankful and celebrate, but it said, pass it on, remember it. May this day never be forgotten what God has done. You know, when we look at our own lives and we look back, can you see what God has done? If you or I were to look back five years ago and say, where would we be today? Would you or I be today where we thought we would have been five years ago? Did I say that right? Five years ago, could you have imagined where you'd be today? Could you have imagined the events that took place in the last five years, five years ago? I did a recap. I shared that with you. Five years in the church, a lot's changed. But this has not changed. God has been faithful. God has been faithful. Every one of us sitting here today have gone through stuff. Let's just call it stuff. Because every one of us have gone through things that we would have never wished we could have gone through. There have been things that happened in our families. There have been things that that happened in our marriages. There have been things that happened with our kids. There have been things that happened with our health. There have been things that happened in our church. There have been things that happened in our country. Things that happened in our world that we could have never imagined. And we're here today. God's been faithful. Esther at the end says to give thanks. Remember, when we do communion, many of us grew up in churches where there was a communion table up in front and it said, do this in remembrance. Remembrance of me, the table said. On Monday, Thursday, I, I'm going to beg you to come to the service Monday, Thursday. Because Monday, Thursday, we're going to have Jews for Jesus here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the organization Jews for Jesus. But they're going to come and they're going to go through the celebration of Passover with us. All of the elements that are symbolic to the Last Supper and elements of the Jewish tradition at the original Last Supper They're going to go through that, set the table for us. Everything from the cushions to the pillows to the tablecloths to the the utensils and walk us through that as a church family. I promise you it will be meaningful and worth your time. And I really want to encourage the kids, our young people, to be there as well. And when we're done, we're going to come to the table and do this in remembrance of him. The Jewish people are a faithful people in remember and Purim. And I look at what this, this means for us. What do, what do we take from a text such as this today? What does it mean, what does it mean for us? I think there's, there's, there's several things here this morning. What time is it? I want to be careful because the last two weeks I know I went way too long. How are you and I remembering what God has done? I think it's so easy in our world today to get so caught up in in, in what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to? How's this going to work out? How's that going to work out? And we forget to look back, don't we? We get so caught up in the here and now that we forget to look back. And God calls us to celebrate his faithfulness, right? Great is thy faithfulness. How do we remember? Yeah, we have Thanksgiving. You know, the Jewish people had Purim, right? It's interesting, too, that when the archaeologists, and this isn't that, that long ago, the archaeologists, when they found the temple, the fortress of Susa, in the temple of Susa, they found a table and, and it's, it's, it's called, it says Purim on it, and it's where they roll dice. I talked about the text, they cast lots, right? They roll dice. That was very common in the ancient world. A high roll meant God was in favor, a low roll meant God was against it. That's how they did business. 
and they'd have their festival to remember what God had done. We have our festivals, Thanksgiving, a time of feasting, right? For a day, and leftovers for the following week. We have Christmas when we remember Jesus' birth. We saw, we're going into Easter. I, I said in the council room this morning, we're going from Esther to Easter. <laughs> we're going to celebrate Easter. We're going to celebrate communion the last Sunday of this month. We're going to celebrate communion on Monday, Thursday to remember. But what, what do we remember? We so often, when we do this, we remember Jesus' death, right, and what that means for us. Sins forgiven, new life now, the promise of eternity for all who believe. But what do we remember as far as we look back? How often do we look back and say, God brought me through this, God brought me through this, God brought me through this. And I'm preaching to myself this morning because I get caught up in the the here and the now and I, I, I worry, you know that. It's my spiritual gift. Were you listening? It's not my spirit's patience. Patience and peace is not always my best attribute, right? Some of you are right there with me. But how often do we take time to just just sit back and say, God, you've been good. God, you've been good. Your mercies are new every morning. And how do we celebrate that? Yes, we celebrated Thanksgiving, we celebrated Easter, we celebrated Christmas. Honestly, every Sunday is a celebration of God's faithfulness, isn't it? Every morning we wake up, we should celebrate that God gave us a new day of life. I think if we did more remembering, again, preaching to myself, maybe we'd do less worrying. So what do we take from Esther? What do we take from all of this? I've been struggling with this all week, worrying about it. How do do you wrap this up? How do you bring Esther to a close? I don't know what you're going to take from it, but I'm going to give you several things, and, and you can take it from there. But number one is, if you miss the first four weeks, go back and listen to them. Now, if you're short on time, and I'm not advocating you try to short the time, but if you're short, if you're short on time, you don't have to listen to the whole service. I know David wants you to listen to the whole service. Catch the worship part too, right? It's on YouTube. The whole service is on YouTube. I really encourage you to watch that because it all comes together. If you're short on time, maybe you're in the car and you want to do like a podcast kind of thing, just just listen to the sermon part. Okay? But go back and listen to the four weeks. Pick up the book if you didn't pick it up. Life Group Stand. Read the story. But go back because if you just take one week, you're missing a piece of it. You get a piece of it, but you're missing the bigger piece. I challenge you to go back. The second thing is this. Recognize that God has a plan. You know the name of the series is You Were Made for This Moment. What moment are you in? What challenge is God putting in front of you? You know, I know there's a lot of challenges in front of me. My future, my health, you know all of that. But you have the same challenges, your future, your health, your family, your work. Maybe it's your finances. What what challenge is God putting in front of you that you just don't understand where it's going to go? Or what insurmountable challenge is God calling you to? I know there's there's many people with cancer right now, right? I, I grieve that with you. I do. Friday night, someone shared with me how their best friend was just diagnosed with cancer, and and they don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Just show up. You're made for that moment. Sometimes keeping our mouth shut is the best thing we can do. But just show up. Where does God want you to shine and show up? What moment is he putting in front of you in a world that seems to be pretty godless, if you ask me? Where does God want you to show up? What moment has he made you for? If he can use an orphan girl like Esther to save a Jewish nation, what can he do with us? Ordinary people. What does God want you to do? I don't know. 
But three is to move forward in confidence. And the only way you can move forward is by looking back, right? You have your faith to move forward, but your faith moving forward is a lot stronger when you look back and say, great is his faithfulness. Because he's been there. He's been good. I've trusted him before. He's brought me safe this far. He'll carry me safe going forward, right? The best way to move forward sometimes is looking back. The windshield's a lot bigger than the rearview mirror, but the rearview mirror gives us a picture of where we've been, and we know God's been there with us. What's your made for the moment moment? And when you look back, the next thing on my list is you need to celebrate. You need to celebrate. Celebrate what God's done. Celebrate it with your family. The Jewish festival of Purim and the reason we do communion is to remember. Celebrate it so that it's not forgotten. You've heard me say it so many times. I'm, I'm very concerned. If I say worried, right? I'm very concerned for the future of the church in the United States. I'm concerned for this church. I'm concerned for my brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church, the Pentecostal Church, the United Church of Christ, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church. I'm concerned for all of us because our faith is, we're, we're often seen as weak. And, and there's just, it's getting tougher and tougher, isn't it? If you're not feeling it, something's wrong. But I have faith that God is going to prevail. Did not Jesus say, on this rock I will build my church? Peter. The most difficult disciple of them all. He said, on that rock he's going to build his church and his church will prevail. And it's going to prevail when you and I remember and celebrate and give thanks and pass it on. If we don't pass it on, we got a problem, don't we? We've got to pass it on. That's what the Jewish people insisted on. Pass it on. Celebrate that every year. Make sure the kids get it and get it and get it and don't forget it. Celebrate it and I jumped ahead. The last is share it. Just share it. Share what you've got. You may think it isn't much, but it may be everything to somebody else. That word of hope, that little spark, that little, that little light, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Pass it on. You may think it's very little, but to someone else, it can be a 180 degree turnaround. You may not expect it. You may never know it. One day you may find out, I did that? I don't know what your made for the moment moment is. I'm not sure I always know what mine is. But that's where God wants us. Because that proves he's in charge and we're not. God is faithful. Give thanks and celebrate. God is in the business of turning things around. And he uses you and I to bring that about. And it's in remembering and celebrating. In remembering and celebrating. That's the only place that we'll find strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again this morning for these words from Scripture. I pray that if any of my words didn't make sense, that you'll clear them up and make this message meaningful to each person here. That we again can realize how faithful you are Lord, we don't have to look back too far. Just this morning, you woke us again and gave us a purpose to be here. 
Lord, there's a purpose when we leave too, and that is to bring that light and hope, to encourage, to remember, to celebrate, and to pass it on. Lord, help us to do that. Lord, may our strength, our hope, be found by remembering your great faithfulness. Just bless us as we move from Esther to Easter. Help us again remember and celebrate all that you've done for us. Lord, at the end of the day, may we all say that God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Amen.